Okay, great. Hi, Glenn. Hi, everybody. Hello, everybody. Good to see you all again. Yay. Hi. Say hi. Hi, hi, hi. Hello, hello. <laughs> wow, so cool. Hello. 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 Oh, I can do that. <laughs> hmm. Cool. All right. Well, it looks like we probably can yeah. start. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, Good to see everybody. Yeah. So, yeah, Steve will start with some instructions and we'll sit together. I'll offer a talk and then uh, Michelle will take the lead on the questions this afternoon. So it's all you, Steve. Welcome. Good morning. Good afternoon and good evening. The yogi quilt is back gathered on our Sunday sit. Notice where your where awareness is abiding right now in this very moment. The body, the body includes visual experience, soundscapes, fragrance and flavor, as well as sensations. Just see where the awareness is inclining. Any one in particular or one or two or three or a sense of a stream of awareness Synchronized with the stream of light and sound, fragrance, flavor, sensation, as well as mental phenomena, thought stream, imagery, the field of emotions, arising, existing, vanishing. Is there a cluster of emotions or one strong emotion standing out? What happens in that moment where awareness sinks with that emotion? And is there other emotions with it? Is there an awareness of that relationship of the emotion and the knowing awareness of it? And what happens when it doesn't go into the habitual story about the emotion or about the thoughts, when it doesn't go into thinking about the thinking process, when it's simply attuned to process and not the content, what's that like? Is the abiding smoother, softer? 
Does it create a more spacious presence, acceptance of what's there? There's nothing to figure out, nothing to get in this practice. We start and end with doing nothing. Abiding isn't doing. It's that ease of awareness. It's just continuously riding the wave of experience. Just like a, a wave sweeping across a bay. You see it lift as, a, as seemingly one continuous a rising of water across the bay and moving towards shore. But like a wave, actually, if we were in the wave, it, it moves like a circle. It's this is continuously circulating energy, which causes the elements that comprise a wave, the earth, water, heat, and air elements to move that wave along. This is what's happening in the body-mind stream. It's a continuous appearing wave, sometimes seemingly solid. and seemingly permanently connected. But as we abide like a wave, there's nothing to stand upon, just sink into it and circulate with it. With that sense of abiding in awareness, we feel that circulation, awareness, like the energy that propels a wave is moving, not in a linear way. We might say it rises and it passes. It rises and it falls, it appears and it vanishes. And that kind of sounds like you know, up and down or this way and that way. It's actually moments of influence where, where we left off with a moment of metta, for example, influences the very next ex moment of experience. Metta, for example, catalyzes other wholesome, skillful mind states and, and consciousness itself and directs it towards goodness towards connecting with goodness anywhere and everywhere. So at most we, we connect with this underlying movement of influence, like the force that moves a wave, and not pay attention to the content, to any story about it. That's how we find that freedom from identification and solidification, holding on, attachment. It's quite effortless. It's any effort put into letting go is holding on more. So instead, it's like continuously lean back in the moment, drop in to the present, feel that motion. So where is awareness abiding? So what's being experienced? Sensation, sound, light, visual, fragrance, flavor, mental thoughts, emotion. What's the quality? the mind with any particular emotion or mental state or series of appearing emotions and mental states. What's the quality of 
the mind? Is it seizing upon those emotions and mental states or is it just noticing, making room, making space? And can you feel the body sensations that usually connect with or are consequences of emotions and strong thought themes? What do those sensations feel like? Where are they? Not necessarily where are they in the body? Where are they in awareness? Is it tight, fluid, compression, release, vibrating, heat, hard, soft? So awareness knows things through a feeling sense feeling the feelings of experience. Feeling is healing. And that the feeling, sensing, knowing of our practice, of our awareness practice is a continuous release of holding on to the moment an effortless release of holding on to anything at all in experience. And all our experience, our entire universe, like the Milky Way itself, is simply a stream of sensations and light and sound and flavor and fragrance and mental phenomena. Always we have the body as an anchor, and always we have the breath as an anchor. An anchor means the stabilizing that comes about from being with a, uh, an experience, synchronizing with the movement of the breath, the vibrations, and sensations, tensions and releases of the breath, for example as continuously as possible. And noticing the transference of influence if we're continuously feeling the sensations of a rising movement and the falling movement. That's that streaming of our own un inner universe is soothing more soothing, calm, calming, more spacious, more clear, more connected, and grounding. Notice if this isn't true for yourself.
in the last couple of minutes of our practice together today. See if any of the Brahma Vihara heart companions are available just by looking. The connected friendliness of metta, the caring compassion of karuna, the empathetic joy, mudita, or the peaceful abiding of upeka, equanimity. Perhaps one or more, or maybe all four, are close, remembering they are actually one. If you practice one of them, all four are being nurtured. All four rise up in the heart, mind. And then just a, a quiet minute of abiding. You can also use the body or any of the sense stores as a portal of connection. The awareness that sinks the sensitivity of the six senses with the experience of seeing, hearing, sensing and knowing to the extent of our imagination and beyond it, which we could call Milky Way streaming. Close at hand, or unlimited expansion. Just feel that emotion of that divine abiding, universal love, care, joy, quiet abiding, equanimity. The bell is ringing, but there is no sound. Oh, sound has arrived. Jesse is giving the Dhamma talk today. Thank you, Steve. The bell is ringing, but there is no sound. Hmm. Oh, let me do that. Hmm. <clears throat> 
um, or it might be a, a little uh, short, uh, shorter talk today. We'll see. I am. Um, I think I've just been struck in uh, some of our gatherings, you know, on these Sundays and just uh, talking to people in my life during the week and, of course, just reflecting on my own life and um, really getting the sense that the There is a heightened experience of tension, <laughs> I think, for 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 many folks in in our lives, in the world, and our relationship to the the world, big picture, the world, our little lives, our little worlds that we're in, and um, you know, there's all kinds of reasons for that. But I I, I think I've become sensitive to the ways uh, increasingly that the you know the the quarantine and the just the ongoing pandemic and kind of carefulness with social contact and you know sort of enforced seclusion that uh, many of us are in has really um, kind of heightened the the sort of pressure of awareness and self awareness that uh, many folks are in. And um, and the impact that that is having, and and both actually the kind of beautiful parts of that, and the parts of that that are, you know, obviously going to be more of a challenge, um, puts us up against our own minds in a way that I think we're not always used to. I think what part of what I see is is we don't have as many of the distractions from ourselves that we normally would get. Uh, the ways that we sort of adjust the pressure in a daily way, in a weekly way, in a monthly way, and these these sort of momentary ways of like kind of getting out of our our sort of very kind of solid and fixed view of ourselves in relationship to the people we're living with, to the world around us, to the news, and that that's very intense, you know, and that a lot of folks are. Um, really kind of getting that sense of weariness, not just, it's like, of course we can keep exporting it, right? It's like, oh, we're, you know, this person is making us angry or this condition in the world is making us terrified or, you know, these folks I'm living with are uh, difficult on whatever levels and, and, and not to say that those things aren't true. Uh, but I, I do think that there's some place of deepening acknowledgement and recognition that we all have of, of how our, our, we are we are the problem <laughs> on an important level, right? That it's like our own our own uh, tendencies, our own responses, our own personalities um, are actually part of what is so challenging about these uh, these times. And I, and I think that's a very it's a very intense and powerful and humbling thing to get to. I think that there's place to get to. Like, of course we can see, okay, greed and craving is, is causes us suffering and <clears throat> aversion causes us suffering. But I think there's something about when we get to start to feel like the, the, the actual, the construction of our basic, our basic personality structure is problematic, uh, is, is, as much as it might be the source of joy and goodness in our lives uh, and in the lives of others, we also see that there's something very fundamental about the way we respond to stimulus and our sense of ourselves that is also part of what creates harm and stress for ourselves and others. And that actually the good and the bad can't be totally separated, right? The, the moral and amoral aspects of that are actually quite intertwined. Um, and it can feel very much like a prison. It can feel very intense when, um, and, and very humbling and a little scary, I think, of like, what does it mean to, uh, to start to see the possibility that our basic personality structure might actually be something 
we need to get liberated from. And what does that mean, right? Does that mean that we need to start to kind of dismantle it and investigate really intensely and um, be very kind of explosive and violent toward ourselves? Does it mean uh, we have to be just loving to ourselves? Does it mean, uh, you know, what, what does that look like in terms of momentary and practical approach to, to be willing to, to let the, the basic sense of our personality be something we also let go of, we also observe, that's willing to, to be brought under the field of what's not just taken for granted and assumed to be true or right. And um, it's a very tall order and it's a very hard thing to get underneath and around and to, to see. Um, it's, so, it's so deeply embedded in our worldview and our, our view of what's happening around us, our opinions about everything, our opinions about ourselves, the sense of our personality, um, of who we are, um, and on one hand, needing to learn how to love and understand and, and, and really come to understand that what are the forces that created these mechanisms of managing life and the ways in which, wow, some of them might be really the, the defensive and adaptive results of hardship, of trauma, of wounds, of pain. Um, and that they were there, you know, have been constructed like that for a reason from a young age. Um, of course, seeing the places where there's natural and built in kindness and generosity and beauty, um, you know, all of these things that we are inspired by and that we have to often, you know, depending on how our personality structure is, maybe we need a little more reminders of those good qualities and to feel good about ourselves and not just uh, shame about the parts of ourselves that are um, still entangled. But I do think that there's, um, there's something even more basic of beyond like good and bad and right and wrong and uh, the, the parts of ourselves we like and the parts of ourselves we don't like of being willing to this, this, this very deep sense of ourselves um, and how, how we might start to loosen up our bond and bondage to that, um, where we might kind of come free from it, not out of a place of aversion, out of anxiety, out of hatred, self-hatred, um, but out of a recognition sometimes of, we have to get that it's painful. The, there's a value that I've seen in people's humility recently, right? Of understanding that, yes, of course, there are things in our lives that are making us anxious or worried or angry, um, and that those are real. Uh, it's not to excuse anyone else's behavior, but to really see that no matter what the conditions are that went into this creation of this identity, this personality, um, ultimately we have responsibility for our own actions and um, how hard it is to change. You know, I think that that piece of this practice is, is very humbling, you know, for all of us. It should be um, this sense of, you know, we want other people to change their behavior. We want people we read about in the news to change their behavior. We want the world to be different. And then we see how hard it is for us to even change one little pattern, you know, to not be triggered by one way someone says something or a voice in our own minds or you know a set of conditions that arises and we're, we're there's so much conditioning going into certain behaviors especially under pressure especially around stress and anxiety and you know how do we um, how do we take this sense of patience and carefulness and and in this process and I, and I do think that um, the, you know, the sort of, of course, looking at our practice and the way that we practice is an important place, of course, for us to naturally begin as yogis. Um, and one of the, one of the places that I really feel like it's been important to encourage yogis as of late is to look at um, holding the possibility of the value of getting lost. I think if we if we look at all kinds of um, you know traditional myth stories um, from all cultures around the world, 
you can see that a lot of a lot of growth, a lot of learning, a lot of these stories happen in conditions under which people sort of enter the woods and lose their way, or they enter an unknown territory and uh, because they're focused on something else, because they're angry, because they're upset, because they're whatever, they they end up they they fall upon sort of mythological time, mythological space. Um, uh, being spirit beings, other, you know, uh, mysterious beings enter their um, awareness. And um, there's a fruitfulness that's understood about getting lost and a danger in that and a fear about around getting lost that's acknowledged. But also that that willingness and the the beauty of it, I think, you know, this sense of when, like, you know, Steve talking about going to the ocean, you know, for all of us, when we enter the ocean, it's like, do we have that sense of, oh, we're just, you know, we're going to get exercise. And so we enter it and we do what we do and we come out, you know, are we doing it to just sort of play around? Where, where do we enter the ocean as a wilderness? As a sense of, oh, like with that willingness to maybe not get totally lost and totally beyond our capacity to bring ourselves back to shore, beyond what's safe, but to be willing to explore a little bit that edge, um, you know, to go out into the reef, to go out a little more and, and, and like explore the world that are less familiar, to not be so certain of, of, of where we are and what we're doing. Because in our practice, I think that sometimes we can get a little bit of a misunderstanding of that. Uh, you will hear from us the the instruction. Oh, you know, you're sitting, you're watching your breath, and you find yourself lost in thought. And when you find yourself lost in thought, you know, you come back to the breath, come back to the present moment. Now, there's logic to that. That 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 instruction makes sense and is good instruction. On the other hand where can we start to acknowledge that actually sometimes when we're lost, it's not just lost in a train of thought, that there isn't a strong sense of self there, <clears throat> right? That, that we've entered a sort of different relationship to mind and matter, maybe that's less familiar, that's a little disorienting. And then the impulse to come back is, a, is actually uh, an impulse coming back to this very familiar sense of ourselves. Oh, me seated here in this room, myself somewhere sort of, you know, maybe behind the eyes a little bit or in here somewhere, that this coming back to the breath, coming back to the present moment <clears throat> is actually a, a reconstituting ourselves back to our most familiar delusion, right? The sense of ourselves sitting here. And on one hand, that can be a grounding, you know, we shouldn't deny ourselves that grounding if we need it. But on the other hand, is there a way that it's also reversed that actually by coming back to ourselves, we have stopped the exploration, we've uh, abandoned the willingness to actually loosen up and relax, as Steve was saying, you know, like not be so tight and so fixed on what we think we're even trying to get out of this practice, out of following the breath or uh, bringing the attention to anything in particular. Where do we allow the mind and the attention to soften, to not actually be as certain of what we're observing, of, of what's happening, of who we are? Um, there's something very important about that willingness in our practice to actually be disoriented. That, that, that the, 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 the mindfulness practice starts to break us out of our normal orientation. And it understands that this is part of the problem. Our normal orientation isn't necessarily wrong. It's just limited. It's like this very fixed worldview of ourselves and, you know, the land we're in and the home we're in and the world we're living in and the politics and the whatever. It's not to say any of that's wrong, but it is very much one slice of reality. And to be able to move into different slices, right, to different layers of reality, not to say that any of them are more true, right? But they're also not less true. Myth time, spirit world, uh, pressure, tension, right? This incredible capacity of mindfulness to start to dissolve some of the solidity and concreteness of myself and me and you and our ideas and this is this and this is that. We don't want to undermine 
mindfulness ability to do that, to do that practice, to start to soften, to allow the attention to move into more exploring terrain, right? To the unknown, to what's not as familiar. Sometimes we are trying to force ourselves into the unfamiliar, right? We want a more interesting experience than just the pain in our knee. And then we can see, okay, wanting, wanting. There's, there's, you know, it's like we have to also see that there are the aversion and the attachment aren't going to get us there. And so there's ways where, it, of course, the, the volitional impact and momentum behind every mind moment of where the mind is directed and the quality of that direction, of course, is going to have impacts. And so it's a tricky thing for us to say, you know, to have no agenda, to, uh, um, you know, not apply pressure, to not try to do anything. Because even though that's true, you can't tell yourself to not do anything. You can't tell yourself to stop applying pressure. There's a, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of an entanglement, a little bit of a paradox. And, and to know that that's fine, that that paradoxical terrain is also important, where it doesn't matter, do I pressure, do I loosen up? It's the tension be, about the decision that's actually causing us stress, that's causing us frustration. And it's like, oh, abiding in the tension feeling that wanting, feeling the not wanting, right? The, the lack of agenda means that you're okay when an agenda arises. Uh, the, the lack of control means you're okay when you see controlling happen. It's uh, this willingness to start to move out of these realms and to explore the different aspects of reality. And so sometimes the self and this personality that's so persistent um, is something we can just sort of loosen around, right? Where it's just like, oh, relaxing and seeing what's around the edges and, and, and letting that not be so um, solid and, and stiff. Sometimes it does mean actually the concentration itself. Okay, you see the mind going, conjuring, doing it sort of like routine. What is it like to bring the attention to a more narrow field, right? To, to bring the attention to the feet when we're walking, when you see yourself just rehearsing for the billionth time, you know, your view on something, you know, it's not to say that the view is wrong again, but it's like, you know what you think about it actually, <laughs> you know, and most of the time you're not really thinking much new about it. And it doesn't mean that we don't think on purpose at times. It's like, oh, actually, I need to consider this and really think things through. And that's an incredible capacity of the mind. But when is the thinking just habit? And what happens when you're taking a walk and you see your sort of, you know, da, 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 and what happens when it's like, oh, you just go to the feet, you go to the breath, you go to the body, you go to seeing. There is a way that you can experience in that moment. Oh, the world opens up to you, literally. You know, you see whatever is around you in a new way. Everything doesn't have to be fitting into the box of the tightness of, of the, the views that we're trying to put it in. And so what are the ways, you know, can we go for a swim, you know, uh, in a way that is um, carry some of this willingness to not be so certain to be able to get a little bit lost. You know, if you go for a walk in the woods, is there a way where it's like, you don't necessarily have to get lost, but are you just fixated on the point you're getting to, on the, you know, how many paces per minute you're walking or whatever, right? Is there like a willingness to stop and observe something and, and get, you know, um, absorbed or get um, interested even in a way that just breaks out of the insistence on the knowing and the certainty and the views, you know? And so there's like the, the clear ways, it's like, well, of course, you know, you can go into nature, you can go into the ocean, you can go for a walk, but it doesn't require those. And in fact, we can do those things in a way that doesn't help our view. We can go for a walk, we can go for a swim, we can do all these things in a way that just keeps reaffirming our little worlds, our little minds, you know? Is there a way, and it's like, you can see on, uh, you know, social media, so much of it is designed and built upon our habits for, for reaffirming and reestablishing and strengthening our views and our opinions, you know. And that doesn't mean that there's something inherently wrong with that, but are there ways that it can be elsewise? You know, I, I did stumble upon uh, the other day uh, a Haida elder telling a myth story from uh, her tradition of the, um, 
how uh, the, the spruce root baskets came into being in the Haida culture. And it was this beautiful, you know, long story, uh, video, right, on YouTube. But it, and she was going back between Haida and in English. And it wasn't the sort of like three minute or 50 second little hit or something. And I was like, wow, I really, you can, you, it can happen. You know, you can break out of the patterning, even on online, on social media. It's like, these things aren't inherently, they are just like so much of our social world and our jobs and our social life. They are built upon mostly strengthening our patterns of, of identity and personality and preference, you know, but that doesn't mean we can't relate to them in ways that are outside of that, right? So it's like, whether it's that or just walking or brushing our teeth, you know, there's a lot of room to start to um, explore and loosen up this sort of small world we're living in and begin to, to open, you know, and open up to the, the different layers of reality. And then I think, you know, I'll just say that part of what's, I think, distinct about the Buddhist path and the, and the, the Vipassana orientation to these different layers of reality that's important to remember is, you know, in many traditions, it's like going into myth time, going into spirit time, uh, breaking out of the society way of being and the the little mind of the little self you know it is it's the work of the the shaman the medicine people the oracles to kind of go into these other spaces to have a relationship with these other beings these other energies and to bring back something that's healing to the community uh or or request the aid of some of these beings to help heal um to help bring back um, some of the this other perspective, um, what's not available in 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 this world, uh, back to it, and that's important, you know, for every society to have. I think what's a little different is in the the Buddha world. There's no. We're all responsible for that work. We're all responsible for the healing and the the coming out and moving into different spaces and um, getting getting that the the perspective we can get on this world from moving into uh, you know other planes of existence and seeing things in different ways, seeing things in a non-self way, seeing things in a unified self way, seeing things in a particular self way. That that process. Um, breaks us out. It is healing to this world. It gives us perspective on how are we dealing with the stresses of this world? How are we relating to the, the you know, the, the news that upsets us, the people that frustrate us, ourselves, our own personality structure? Is there medicine that we're bringing back from uh, these journeys, uh, from the willingness to get lost, that is healing, that gives us perspective of like, oh, this isn't the only way to see things. This is, there are other versions, there's other perspectives, kaleidoscopic on what's happening here that can help us not lose our connection to our own goodness amidst all the strain, amidst all the stress, amidst all the hatred, right, that actually allows us to um, find that connection and maintain it to our own care for ourselves and others, for our peace of mind, our stability amidst the hardships, you know, of the life and the world that we're living. And of course, in the Buddha's path, it isn't about just this one other world we go to, but it's about knowing all of these different ways of experiencing reality and seeing that the, ultimately they all are subject to the same forces of impermanence, of uh, undependability, unsatisfactoriness, of corelessness, of non-self, that they're all conditioned phenomena. And all these planes of myth realm and spirit, all these worlds are all maintain this basic truth of all conditioned phenomena, all things that arise because of something else, because of condition, are subject to change when those conditions change, subject to pass away when those conditions change, no matter what realm we're in. And so that deeper truth that there is also the unconditioned of Nibbana, right, that, that the yogi ultimately 
seeks to find rest in, right? This refuge where there is no coming and going, there is no birth and death, there is no um, arising and passing. Even consciousness doesn't arise. This is what the, the Buddha found his way to and had total access to that, right? And, think, and, and, and the profound perspective that gives on all of these realms, all of the coming and going, all of the frustration and worries and anxiety and greed and hatred and oppression and um, change in the world, the knowledge of the unconditioned gives the ultimate perspective to all of it and how powerful that is how worthy that is of our efforts, how worthy of it is as a goal. And to also know, um, you know, the Buddha is said to have been able to, it's not like the Buddha or Arahants are always living in the unconditioned in Nibbana, right? The, the Buddha, you know, still lived in the world. He had thoughts occurred. He had thoughts. He thought about things. He did actions. You know, he was involved. Consciousness arose in him. Um, but, you know, the, the, it is said that, you know, he had access to, to the unconditioned whenever he want. You could just sort of turn it on and, you know, go into Nibbana at any moment. Mahasi Saida tells a story of these, um, these two monks who were traveling uh, during uh, the period of the rains retreat where monks are really supposed to be settled in one place for those three month period because the, the rains and they're meant to be a time of intensive practice. And it, it turns out these two monks, one was the senior and one was the student, um, uh, but they were both arahants. They were both fully enlightened um, beings. Totally had uprooted, you know, greed, hatred and delusion. Um, you know, the, they had attained the goal of the holy life and yet the rains were coming and they come upon a monastery and the monastery only had room for one. And so, of course, the younger said, was, oh, okay, the older one, you know, you go into the monastery, take shelter there and I'll spend the rains outside the monastery in the forest. And um, it said that because of their different types of enlightenment, right? They're, they were both arahants, but they were different kinds of arahant. And so the younger one happened to be one that practiced more concentration. And um, the older one didn't practice as much concentration, had still uh, managed to attain full liberation, but, but wasn't as um, steeped in that. And so what it was said that during this three month period, you know, they both practiced and uh, they went on their way at the end. And at, at the end, the older monk asked the younger monk, you know, were you able to um, easily attain your fruition experience of Nibbana? You know, were you able to just go into the unconditioned at ease, at will? And the young one said, oh yeah, it was, it was no problem, right? Even though he was out in the rain and at the foot of a tree and sort of subject to all these hard conditions. And he asked his teacher, he said, were you able to? And he said, no, I was worried about you. You know, I, I spent the three months, you know, like, wow, like really worried about your well-being out here. And so I, I wasn't able to attain that, um, that perfect peace of the unconditioned for those three months. And so I think there's something um, so beautiful actually about that story and, and maybe kind of pulling apart like all of our projections of what we think enlightenment might mean, but that you have this, on one hand, you have the, the, this younger monk who might be more of the vision we think, no matter what the conditions are, it's like, bam, he just could drop into, you know, no coming, no, no going, you know, this like perfect peace. And yet here you have, um, their teacher, this older, more experienced monk, also an arahant, but for his concern, for his student, actually didn't have that perfect concentration, didn't have the, the, the ability in those conditions to simply drop into the perfect peace of Nibbana. And so I think that for us, it gives us a little bit of maybe a healthy, um, a healthy dose of some good medicine that we don't hold ourselves uh, 
we're not so hard on ourselves for getting frustrated, right? For not having access to total perfect peace all the time, given what's happening in the world, given what's happening in our lives, given how little protection so many people have in their daily lives of just like the seclusion and the, the perfect conditions. It's like, of course, we're going to get frustrated. Even this Arahant, who was totally enlightened, he couldn't even get totally at peace in these moments. And maybe that gives us a little bit of a sense of like, oh, maybe a different sense of what that peace is, uh, but also a little bit of kind of compassion and understanding um, for, for where we are and for how hard it is actually to find our way to this place of tenderness and acceptance and, and fluidity and strength. Um, and, and gentleness and all these beautiful patience and all of these qualities that we aspire to in the midst of, you know, the, the hardship of reality, that it is genuinely hard, genuinely hard to do. And that this work of yogi, of being a yogi is, is, is this constant uh, endeavoring, you know, of learning to bring attention, to apply pressure, to release pressure, to, to try to find our ways and navigate these, these wild waters and terrains. But to just remember that, that there are places where actually we also do need to get let go of that which might be driving us. That the energy that's so called for in our practice might not always be the energy we recognize because it doesn't have a lot of me in it. The energy uh, that's more balanced, might be more confused, more bewildered, less certain, less clear, uh, but actually more authentically mindful. And when we're very clear and very driven and uh, very certain in our practice, that perhaps that's a, a place where we should mm, think about pausing, about wondering, oh, what's is there something tight here? Is there something overly rigid, overly solid, and be willing to start to perhaps loosen up and let go and move back again into the place of unknowing. So um, I think I'll end there today. Yeah, and just to really encourage everyone, you know, to just know that it's, we are in, fascinating times and uh, the work we're doing is very, very important. We might not always see the social benefit of it, but on some level it can't be denied that in, in all of the ev evocations that we find in our world and our lives, to, to be developing more and more, little by little, the ability to stay connected to our own goodness and to goodness in general um, bears beautiful fruit and um, only seems like it will be more and more necessary and bear uh, sweeter and sweeter fruit. So, yeah, thank you. And, um, yeah, we'll uh, I'll let Michelle um, take charge of the question period for a little while. You have to unmute yourself there, Michelle, and maybe lift your mic up again a little. Is that uh, the sound okay? It sounds great. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, and then again, just a, and then a I will also I will also ask Steve and Jesse at times to join in, but I'll start. If anyone have any questions about anything with their practice or the instructions today or the talk. It looks like Quinn has a question, and uh, but just so for everyone to know, we're not always able to see you if you're raising your hand. So there's like a little blue raise your hand button on the if you click I think on the participants or on the chat thing on the right you should be able to click a button that we see that you've raised your hand uh, so we can know you can be in the queue but yeah Quinn yeah uh, you gotta unmute here you go okay well um, your story about the two arahat uh, is very reassuring for me uh, because lately, I felt like I'm drowning. Uh, the whole world is on fire. And um, sometimes the emotions are overwhelming. And, um, and then, then it, you, your story is telling me that it's okay. Wherever I am, it's all right. And to just call in uh, equanimity to allow it to be. 
so uh, thank you for that story. Uh, I also have a question uh, about the paradox. Uh, on one hand, uh, you said, or Steve also said, it's all causes and conditioning. So then uh, the, the other paradox is, uh, but still I have to take responsibility for my actions. So how do I reconcile the, these two paradoxes? Um, it's I'm on, right? Okay. Um, I think it's about seeing, um, or it's like understanding that equanimity uh, includes in the Brahma Vihara, it includes understanding karma or kama. And I think that that the kind of <laughs> gist of that understanding is that whatever is happening in the present moment, right, the causes and conditions, they can go back thousands of years or appear from five seconds ago, that the causes and conditions are simply understood by, by understanding motivation. And that's like why we, we emphasize intention and motivation so much because if we start to understand that we can act, we can take action from anger or we can be mindful of that anger and work with that however we do, which with we, we might be able to, or anxiety about the world right now or whatever, that, that we can understand that that anxiety or anger or whatever is appearing could be coming up from 10 lifetimes ago or five seconds ago and that actually it doesn't matter <laughs> what matters is how we're responding now everything is about how you're responding this moment this moment this moment and that if we get that um, that deep sense of uh, liberation is letting all that all that past go and just getting to the moment where you see that you have a choice. This is about choice, right? So the, the choice is not in what's appearing, but the choice is in how you relate to what's appearing, right? And that, so that, that you learn how to, I see that, how I see that is saying, um, that I'm here living out karma, that we're all here, whether collectively, collectively right now, we are living out some karma. And so we, we just go for that ride, right? You show, you just like get that, that you show up for the karma. And then do you, do you create more negative karma? Like we are all capable of that right now. We can add more, we can add more, stuff into this or we can go wait a minute i'm here to get liberated and that i think that reminder we, we're needing that we're all needing that more and more and more and more and more to kind of um who is who can who can hold this and of course the 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 little me can't hold it. the the anger can't hold this the anxiety can't hold this the mindfulness can hold this the metta can hold it the compassion can hold it which isn't to say the paradox is to get that i can say if i look at the news i'll say of course <laughs> of course of course anxiety is going to come up i mean come on like of course like that it's designed we're we're in a point where it's designed to get us afraid you know so like that that paradox is that you could have tasted complete choice and liberation 5 seconds ago but maybe this moment you can't i think that's what i feel like for most people, it's much more like a roller coaster right now, right? We're on, we're on a ride that is really uh, going, going intensely, going fast, and that uh, it, seems like it's, it seems like it's always getting worse, you know, and, and it's like to, to just kind of show up and, and get, I have a choice right now. There's a choice right now. There's a choice right now. There's a choice right now. And if you don't, if you, if you really, as Jesse says, if you get lost, 
um, there's something always to learn from that. You know, that, that not only are we here living out karma, but, but ultimately the paradox is that we're learning, we're learning how to live out karma. We're learning how to live out karma with more grace, with more dignity, with more choice. Yeah. But certainly one wouldn't say, um, I don't think things are as catastrophic as they could get. <laughs> no, I don't. I just don't. I think, I think it's, you know, I think that it's important to remember that. I think it's important to not, we're not in the apocalypse yet. You know, watch out for thinking that. Be careful. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Michelle and Steven and Jesse. Um, hi. Um, thank you so much for your talk, Jesse. Um, like when I also found the story of the Arahants, very reassuring. Um, and I think the question that I had in mind to ask um, was about working with fear and anger. Um, so in the situation, in my current living situation, um, I have a new housemate um, who moved in a few months ago, and I found myself in really intense conflict with this person. Um, a lot of anger and a lot of fear underlying that anger. Um, and I'm finding because we share a space that's very intimate, um, that it's difficult to escape, um, that I'm constantly coming up against it and there's like constant reminders of it. Um, and I'm trying hard to not put a storyline behind it, but the story always just like it just, it comes up. Um, I, I have an immediate response and then Steve, Steve or Jesse can add. It's a very important question in terms of um, for all of us who live with other people. Um, and I think that the bottom line is, is aversion, is anger okay for you to have appear? Is the aversion okay? Because that's usually most of us will be thinking we shouldn't have so much anger, like we should be able to work with it. Or So the, the, the first layer is really, you know, okay, this person is teaching me how to get more um, able to work with my anger. How about that? Like, oh boy, I'm going to exaggerate, but oh boy, this person's come into my life and it's, he's or she is really going to help or whatever they, uh, whatever pronoun, they're going to uh, really help me learn how to be with, uh, get a better relationship to my own anger. If you can shift it to that, and that it's because I think we will have an idea that maybe we're at 90% anger all day, and that it should go down to 70, right? Or like, if I work with this, it should go down to 40, or like, try to throw that out the window and just kind of shift, the next layer would be to shift to, um, some people are more pleasant for, like the pleasant comes up more and some people more unpleasant comes up more and you can't control that. Like it, mo some people are just, their behavior just triggers more uh, for us I'm saying, you know, inside you, the karma will be that they'll be much more unpleasant. And being able to, again, um, look at the question is, what is love? And is love just when someone is pleasant? Or is love capable not the not the anger the anger can't hold this but the the met the the word love we tend to um 
not investigate it enough to see that the love can actually include the unpleasant. Uh, but you, you might have to start noting it like soft mental notes of like just walking around and seeing some behavior, realizing the behavior, the unpleasant behavior is not, is not the person. You're going to have to work hard, right? Like, and that you'll be able to be able to, to start noticing, can you care about this person even if they're unpleasant most of the time, right? Like, I'm, I'm being I'm being very careful here to just like I, I might walk around just going unpleasant 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 without the extra you know maybe even swear words right <laughs> you know which are also important to include if that's what's there but I'm going by layers so there's that layer of just accepting it to the point you, where you can't accept it and remove yourself can you get away to, are you trapped to the point where you can't go in your, can you get in a room that the person isn't in? Yeah, yeah. And um, yes, I, I think like I have been working on the distancing because I, I find that's, that's important because I think a lot of times I had a part of me maybe, um, I think there's like this desire for intimacy and closeness with people just like as a normal, the way that, that my conditioning is, there's this desire for intimacy and closeness. And so I've had to let go of a lot of that because it's just not gonna happen. <laughs> great. great, that's great. You're well on the way. You get enough space, you keep getting enough space, get enough distance. You know, my family taught this. My family's in Massachusetts. I'm in Hawaii. I have the perfect distance to like work, right? No, it's like, wait, right? So I got found the distance with which I could feel meta. It's, it's, it's very important to see that taught me everything that I could feel meta when I, I got enough distance. And it wasn't like when I move into it that there isn't something that will trigger the aversion again and the unpleasantness, but it taught me that it's okay. It taught me it's okay to get the distance and that the aversion's okay. Thankfully, your family doesn't watch this on Facebook. Oh, yes. <laughs> Don't put this one up on YouTube, Jesse. <laughs> Skip this one. <laughs> Okay, but, I, I, I have one question of just like, because when you said it, I just want to make sure. I mean, when you say that there's like fear underneath it, it's not, it, or do you feel like you're, you're afraid of your, for your physical well-being, like with this person in the? No, I okay. think it's, I think it's more fear of, like, I think there's a sense of safety that's associated with, you know, living in a, in a place. And I think it's that violation of that sense of safety in very subtle, but distinct ways mm -hmm. um you know that just comes with cohabiting with other people like I don't think I'm in any physical danger or you know um it's it's really like a psychological um yeah prison okay. sometimes yeah, yeah that feels like mm -hmm. uh, yeah yeah I'm also yeah I'm also working on other ways of remedying the situation um through more practical means of finding another place um but it's, well, that, it's a, that's that's important it's a process yeah. yeah but it's important that if it feels like it's um not possible to feel enough comfort and safety in what our home our home is a place where we need to have enough of that and if it, it it doesn't, it's it's okay to leave. That's all part of this whole process. It's a, it's like a healthy boundary. Yeah. Steve, Steve, did you have anything to add or? No. Okay. But I just uh, maybe I'll just sort of reaffirm, Michelle. So it's like conditions matter. We're aiming. For, we want to be like unconditionally loving and a peaceful and all of these beautiful things, but conditions do matter in terms of like if you're always in a condition that feels too stressful and too oppressive and too confining it's just it's not it's not that it's impossible right I mean people get you know have 
spiritual liberation in prison, literally prison, right? So it's not that it isn't possible, but it's you're up against a lot more and that there are going to be conditions for each of us that are where you're going to, that'll be more supportive of having tenderness towards a difficult person or acceptance towards a difficult person. And so, you know, I think all of these things are, are helpful and like trying and like, just like, you know, Michelle is saying, and you're saying it's like, low expectations to really get how perhaps it's like our own need for the relationship that's getting in the way of like where it actually just naturally needs to fall. But I think also taking the practical steps of like, oh, actually these conditions are not appropriate for your own growth and, and taking steps to change them, you know, because that part also feels important where it's not, we don't want to just be doormats to other people's aversion or other people's, you know, kind of misbehavior or whatever, you know, it's like at some point you need, you need to, yeah, take action to whatever degree we can in whatever conditions we can to, to, you know, set more appropriate boundaries. Yeah. Mm. Good, Good luck, luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good to see you. Uh, we have Kay and then Ted after that. Let's see, Kay. Hey. Yeah. Hey. Hey. Uh, I've been having really hard time practicing formally, uh, even like 10 minute walking or 10 minute sitting, um, it just gets really, uh, not unbearable, but I, I just notice all the ways and tools that I'm trying to fix everything. And I guess maybe I see that a little more because like Jesse said it's like I'm cooking all the time um I don't have job so I have a lot of practice time and and it was wonderful um and I've had period that was hard to practice form like do formal practice before um but it just seems another level of just seeing um, how how I I really hate uncertainty <laughs> and uh, I I just yeah it's just just the habitual pattern of like oh my god I really can't I can't be lost it's it's hard to be lost and i hate it and i bring him to rise rising rising and falling and it just becomes oh my god like i'm i'm, <laughs> I'm trying to just like have a little bit sense of solidity to me and which is sometimes great i know that and at the same time i just then it just becomes doubting um yeah, uh, can't sit or walk <laughs> when I do. <laughs> Michelle, you're muted. Oh, you go. And you want to move your mic again a little? I can start, but um, I'd like Steve and Jesse to add in. It. Um, I have a couple things. One, just briefly, it would be to um, see if you can accept that at the in those moments you don't feel like you can sit. Can is that possible? Yeah, to some extent, yes. Okay, so because that's that's the that's um, if you have motivation to do something at that point without that acceptance it'll just reinforce aversion to that place. So I think that, that, that once you get established that place of like, it's okay to be there, it, you don't have to be sitting, sitting to practice. You know, so like I, I find um, lately um, that I've been bringing back in soft mental notes um, to my practice and I'm doing a lot of just saying the word touching touching so that like when I'm <laughs> if you make the bed or like <laughs> brush your teeth or like a lot of my practice the last few days has been 
just, you know, getting ready for this call, like just touching the computer, touching, touching. And it's, I think that that bringing in, you know, I can, you can hear it in everybody. There's such a need for reassurance when we can't be with uncertainty. Now, this might not be helpful for you. I'm not saying that touching, touching is the way for me, it makes me feel more connected. And it doesn't have to be with a person. It can be with water, with the elements, with wind. It's like touching, touching. It's like, um, I find it helpful. But if I didn't find it helpful, I wouldn't do it. Do you see what I mean? I might, um, you know, try just going outside and being with sound. Or I feel like it's important to be very creative with the practice and just find something um, either that you can be with or forget about it for a while. You know, if you go for a walk and just are aware of um, seeing the color of people's clothes, like I, I go, I can go very far with creativity, with practice. And, and I think be careful of feeling like um, you need to be doing something formal when you can't. Because often I think for, again, hearing a lot of people lately, there's a fear of dropping into too much maybe grief or too much fear. Like it's okay to hold back, right? At, at times in practice and not let yourself drop in too far. It, it's fine. In fact, it's uh, strengthening. It's not weakness. It's a strength to know. Um, I, I can look back at so many times in my life or, or times now where I'm just like, no, I'm not going to do that right now. It's too much to um, hold. I need to go water the garden. <laughs> I don't know. You know, whatever. I, like I said, I can come up with a lot of different ways to be um, alive and here without necessarily fi making it too uh, much of a... Um, formal, something formal. You might not have found it yet. Yeah. There, there are some stuff then I find myself giving, oh, well, I'll give myself a slack or break and like, and I feel like I'm going too far. So I'm like, oh, this, like this much break, like I don't deserve kind of and then I just go back to, okay, then I'll, okay, I had a little break, so I should back. Um, I, I think uh, that's a really good thing to look at what you deserve. You know, it's like, why can't you deserve more? <laughs> It's so sad, right? Like, oh my God, you know. If I need to, I read a fairy tale. Uh, because that works for me. You know, just, you take a, it's like, a, and take it with all the humor and love in your heart. It's like, ha, 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 I need a five-hour break. What's wrong with that? Ha, 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 ha. That's what, if that's what you need, then you, then you do it. How are you doing with that? Yeah, I think, yeah, that's a, that's a great place that why, why and what do I deserve and why don't I not deserve something that's this time or space. And I, I think there's a way you can look at it that's not, that you can, integrate it in your practice that doesn't get you too involved in it either. I mean, I think that's, it's part of the tricky. It's like, you don't have to just go to reflecting on, you know, your psychological composition, but acknowledging that, oh, a sense of worthlessness or self-hatred arose and that you believed it and that that led you to a different you know, to avert the mind, bring it to a different object or to start practicing or opposite. I think it's like just, just a little bit of that integration could help. And like, so 
So if you're trying to do your walking and you feel like you're, it's too anxious, you're just, you can't, you're, you're too restless, um, then I think it's like what Michelle said, it stands true. Like, well, don't, you don't need to always be putting the pressure on to practice formally, but it, it still might be important to recognize restlessness, recognize anxiety before you then go decide to stop practicing, right? And to start to start to see just these moments rather than like the, the kind of like bigger structure around it psychologically, but of seeing like, oh, there's, a, there's anxiety and it feels like too much to kind of get involved and I can't fight it, but I also can't kind of go into it. And so I'm going to do a healthy distraction, which is like 100% totally actually part of the practice, right? It's like, I'm actually going to bring the attention to something that's, that's pleasant, that's distracting in a way that's uplifting the mind. Verse, whereas if you don't know the moment of aversion or the moment of anxiety or restlessness, then that distraction feels unhealthy and unwholesome because you're not acknowledging that you're doing it on purpose. And so I think that just like a little bit of being like, oh, this walking is hard and there's just because there's restlessness and I'm like, ah, it just feels crazy. So I'm just going to stop because you recognize that is a very different thing than not recognizing it and then stopping and doing something else. You know what I'm trying to say? It's just like that one moment yeah. or the moment of like, oh, worthlessness or self-judgment or self-hatred and the pain of that. And is it, what is the thing motivating you? Is it actually that the reading or the distraction wasn't captivating or that this thing feels so painful and so toxic that we're going to run from it back to practice versus back to a nap or whatever. I mean, I think that's the other thing. It's like in the moment, the, the, the pain is probably coming from the emotion and the thought, not from the distraction. And so, um, you know, it's like, as long as there's a little moment of recognition and labeling and naming it, then whichever way you end up going with it doesn't have to always feel like it's because you're, something unseen is in control of you. It's like, oh, something is seen and then you're responding to it in whatever way it feels skillful. And it might even look exactly the same, but you won't feel so kind of beholden to it. You know, I don't know if that makes sense. Hmm. Um, okay, Ted and then Gita. So let's see. Ted, Can you there? hear me? Yes. Hear me? All right. Um, the practice, as has been discussed, is fairly personal. One works on oneself. One moves through the world and hopefully uses the practice as we move through the world. Uh, in my particular part of the world, politics has come up and we're in the news every single night. And um, I'm down there supporting the movement that's going on while the gas and the bullets and everything are um, moving around. I'm using meta, I'm using equanimity. There are times when people will start to get angry with one another and I'll inconspicuously as possible move in between them and just be equanimous during that period. Um, but there are times when the crowd itself becomes a single tornado and um, at those times, I pull up Stephen's stories about surfing with the sharks and, um, and how that helps him. And what I really, my question is that we're working to change ourselves, but as Jesse and Michelle have talked about, we're in an a interesting time and we can also work to change the time and that's what I'm doing but there are times when the equanimity and the meta starts to slip away when I'm in the middle of this tornado and I just would like some tips on what might be helpful in keeping that from slipping away altogether. Thanks Ted. 
And Steve, do you want to talk about surfing with the sharks? <laughs> I mean, I do, I do think about Stephen surfing with the sharks when I'm in the middle of this tornado. That's right, one of the right. things that helps ground me. Right. That's what I was going to say. Maybe yeah. Steve has something more to say about it. Um, we, I'm sure we all will have something to say about living in uh, Portland. Uh, Steve, you're muted right now. You have to unmute yourself. Oh, that's why no one has heard me. Yeah. Yeah, I've been trying to get you to say something. Great. I, I didn't know I was muted. Uh, when the sharks circle, I paddle in. Okay. Very succinct. Yep. Do that. You'll be okay. I mean the um and when they'd leave I would paddle back out. Okay. There's nothing much we can do in a tornado, Ted, right? Right. Um except try to remain equanimous and be aware of one's moment. That's right. So as long as you can sustain that, you're okay in the center of the tornado. I'm sustaining that pretty well. Um, I don't have any fear. At my age, it's going to come when it comes, and I'm I'm all right with that. It's just that um, I worry when the the practice starts slipping away because of the crowd dynamics. So that's when you step out. That's when I paddle away from where the sharks are circling. Okay. I'm, I'm Michelle, do you want to say something before I, you, you're, yeah. Um, uh, I've just been, um, you know, all these Zoom calls and stuff, everyone has like these book, stacks of books now, like here and there <laughs> to like get your computer up to the right level, you know, for the screen. And one of the main books I've had, which I have exchanged now because it's like one of the thickest books I have is called The Martyr's Mirror. And it's a um, very old from like 1600 text of um, really it was like the Mennonites and, and uh, Amish folks kind of compiled this book as far as I understand history. And it's, and it's a thousand page tom of just like Christian martyrs from the time of Jesus to 1600s. And it is pretty intense. Uh, um, my grandmother was Mennonite. And so it's uh, something I haven't read a lot. I, I've kind of like had this book is there and, I don't usually kind of read it very inten intently because it's just like, it's very intense. It's like very intense graphic depictions. And then these letters of these um, Mennonites and followers of this guy, Peter Waldo, you know, this is like 11, 1100s, right? Where they weren't into, um, uh, they weren't, they had a different view of, Jesus' teachings and the Catholic Church in the 1100s. And that was like a deadly thing to have at that point. So you basically have a thousand pages, not to go into detail, of just like people writing letters to their children before they're burned at the stake. And it's like hundreds and thousands of people, right, of these intense stories of basically this commitment that they had to their values and their love and their sense of righteousness in the face of so much intense, more intense than I think probably any of us can imagine in terms of like whether we have been tested to the degree that we have been tested in our conviction and commitment to love and to equanimity and to the faith that we have in these things and the goodness of them and, and the sense of victory in our spiritual lives being more important at times perhaps than victory over an outer enemy um, and uh, an oppressive force in the world and where that 
where that line is for any of us of like what's more important like winning here in this situation or staying connected to what you're trying to do and that you are in a condition and a situation in which you're going to be you're being more tested than many right now um and i don't always want to frame it in terms of test because i do think that it doesn't i want it there's something about like i think there's plenty of situations in which i would be the, like i would be like fine we'll go with your baptism version and I won't get burned at the stake and I'll just live a little bit less according to my values. <laughs> you know, like I, I, I'm not always sure that like, like that it's worth the commitment, you know, to, but on the other hand, to these basic levels of, of kindness and equanimity and compassion, that feels more, you know, the, 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 what does it mean to betray those for ourselves and for the world? And what are we creating? Like Michelle said about, you know, what's the comma we're generating in all of our actions, especially when they have social significance on this, on this broader page. I mean, I just think that you're in the, as you said, tornado of it, you're in the fire of it right now. And um, it's actually very beautiful. You know, it's very beautiful. Um, but to know that, and to acknowledge that this is a very hard place and the, the, the social value of it won't always be clear, but the spiritual value of it will always be clear. And that whether that's enough for any of us in any given moment is to be seen. And you've seen it here and there in your own way over these days and weeks and months. Um, but I just, um, I just, there's something, I think we are all entering, we're all being tested more in in powerful ways and we're we're coming up against this more and the sense of our responsibility in the world our responsibility to ourselves is more alive and more visceral and that your um that it is heroic and that it's beautiful that it's it's like that you're trying is incredible and 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 it's so worthy and of course there's going to be doubt and of course there's going to be fear and of course there's going to be all these other things and kind of just like you know you just you you do the practice and you take it one moment at a time and you end one situation at a time and feel like where's the place where you are strong in it? Where's the place where you um, are maybe more flexible? Where's the place where you back run? You know, where do you go in? Where do you run? And where is that? Where can running be skillful? And where is going in skillful? And being being very clear about the power of the forces that we're up against um, is an important part of that equation of, of, of determining, you know, where we're moving in and we're moving away emotionally and physically. Yeah. So thanks for, for doing it and trying to keep it, trying to keep trying to do it uh, in the conditions that you are. I'm just keeping the practice really present while it's happening. That's it. Michelle, you're, you're muted yeah, there. Yeah, I know. It's like the culmination of all of your practice, Ted. Yeah, it is. That's what it seems like. Very beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Very moving. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Hmm. Uh, Gita, you're back. Are you there? Gita. Yeah, I, you look like you're unmuted, but I can't hear you. Let's see. I'll try to look for you. Oh, oh I can I see your her. lips. Yeah, I can see your Where lips moving. You? There you are. Okay. Oh, but I still can't hear you, Gita, even though you're unmuted. Ah, oh, what's wrong? No. Can you type in your question to the comments? Uh, am I, am I, can you hear me? I can. She's going to, oh, she says, Gita just said okay, she'll ask later. I, do you have, a, I mean, I'm so ignorant with a computer. It, do you have a mute button in your bottom left corner that you can unmute? That's not it, Michelle. You can see oh. here she's unmuted. Oh, okay. But there's just something else going her. Oh, well. Her, her speaker is her microphone. That's the only thing I know. <laughs> oh, well. Oh, good to see you. On her computer. 
Is the volume turned up? Yeah, that shouldn't be affecting her microphone. Well. Oh, well, good to see you. Good to see <laughs> yeah, you, Gika. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> uh, looks like Tan has a question there. There we go. Thank you, Michelle, for reminding us about the karma. That's very helpful, and I, I do it every day following the Buddha's instruction of that as a daily recollection of I'm the owner of my karma, heir to my karma, born of my karma, related to my karma. So I, I do that every day, so that's, that's helpful. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's essential to understand these times and our relationship to them, Tan. I think it's great. You know, it's. Um, It helps us to be clear that we have a choice now, moment by moment, and how we're relating to what's happening. So it's it's re, it's always remembering that it it's in in the practice. It's how we're relating to what's happening that is li, what's liberating, not what's happening. It's great. Thank Thanks. Much. Yeah. Mm. Well, maybe that's a good place to end for today. Hmm. Oh, time Actually, may, may I make an announcement? Uh, just um, we, we have our monthly retreat coming up this weekend. For those of you who don't know, every month we are on second Saturday and Sunday of the month. We have a retreat outdoor on Hawaloa Ridge Park, which is in this COVID-19, this is ideal to sit together outdoor six feet apart. So it's pretty safe. We still suggest that people wear a mask when, when we gather and bring your own sitting gear to sit on the ground and bring your own lunch. And we sit together from, from 10 to 3, Saturday and Sunday. So beautiful up there. So for, for COVID-19, sitting together outdoor would be ideal. Great. Uh, it, Tan, is the info on a website or something? Or they just do they have to register or just can show up? No, no need to register. Just come up. There might so, be a link on Vipassana Hawaii uh, mm -hmm. about that, about, you know, if you go to Vipassana Hawaii website, there might be a link, if I remember, Jesse, you may have put a link to uh, Honolulu Dharma community where we yeah. post that. So you click on that link, you will see more detail. But okay. any question, you can call us uh, 282-6578. But just show up anyway, just make sure to bring something to sit on the ground, usually like a yoga mat and the Zafu or maybe a chair. Some people bring a beach chair or a chair or something to sit on and wear a hat and maybe a, 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 a windbreaker because if it's windy, it could be a little bit cold. So. Okay. Yeah, I have a question. I've been feeling so much anger against Donald Trump and all the Republicans who support his and I try to be aware of the anger, but since the, the anger is so much, so what can I do? To deal with it? Steve, Steve, do you want to say anything or do you want me to answer more? Go ahead. Oh, but you have to unmute, Steve. You have to unmute. Sun, okay. yeah. what do you do? I just not anger, anger, anger. But okay. And then I, Can I'm you feel not it? supposed to feel it. After, yes, you're supposed to feel it. N noting can be a shield. It can be a defense. If you just use labeling, it can push the experience away. If we really feel anger, and there's wisdom that knows the anger. There's nothing for it to stay attached to because it's painful. If we're really seeing something, we let go. If we don't, that's, that's how dukkha arises. Dukkha is only there because of the conditions of attachment and ignorance. If we understand and feel the pain of attachment, there's no, and ignorance, then 
there's no suffering. If you make a story out of it, it's going to perpetuate itself. The labels of this party or that party. I mean, what if there's re what if there are lots of Republicans here right now in our city? What do you want to tell them? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to raise their hand. And they like. I know Republicans. I have friends who are Republicans. I feel the anger, but even though I'm not anger, and even though I know it must be like. But you already karma. said you don't feel it. it don't go into <laughs> karma. It's a more <laughs> defensive explanation. Feel the. Mm -hmm. Feel your anger. Right. <laughs> it's um. Just keep saying, of course, we're in times that are extremely unpleasant. It's, ex it's extremely painful. Of course, a version is coming up. And it's like, you don't want the psychotic, sociopathic energy to win. You don't, you don't want the insanity to win. How you, your body is telling you that we're in an, a very crazy situation and of course you're going to be upset. But then it's like the choice, the liberation is, 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 is as Steve is saying, how you're relating to it. And so if, you're, if you are making that story, of course you will, but it's like coming back to uh, how can you make use of this spiritually? as well as, of course, doing what we do to try to make sure this stops, right? We, ha we have to try do our best to make sure it stops. But in the meantime, in moment to moment, you, um, you can get stronger and stronger in this, not weaker and weaker. That's a choice. You're right. I think the unpleasantness too. It's, it's very unpleasant. unpleasant. It's very unpleasant. It's it's like most of the time, if you're paying attention to this, it's unpleasant. <laughs> so yeah, I, I skip some time. If I find it more helpful to be mindful of the unpleasantness, right. easier to be mindful of unpleasantness than to be mindful of the anger itself. That's right, and then, John. And then when when it's it's kind of going away, and then we can I can replace that with compassion instead of knowing that the person needs a lot of compassion, he or she is, is creating a lot of bad karma and then going to suffer from mm -hmm. it. So knowing that we can have compassion for the person and that's really helpful too. Yeah, and if you can't, everyone's different with this. So it's like not to have a, but it, you're correct in that for, for, for some people, being able to shift to being aware of just that it's unpleasant will be very helpful. Very helpful. Yeah. That's uh, correct. <laughs> I want to, you know, our uh, Sayada and at the Chazo retreat, Sayada Panyananda, a couple of years in a row now, he's told a little story at some point. I can't remember where. It's always like a certain point in the retreat about like when you get angry that you're you're fulfilling your enemy's wishes and that's like it's such a great sort of like psychological like i don't know kind of twist on it where it's like you when you're angry you look ugly and that makes your enemy happy you know when you're angry you like make bad decisions and that makes your enemy happy and so it's not even trying to say that he's not your enemy he's just trying to say like by by buying into that dynamic you're like fulfilling their wishes and so if you want to keep them your enemy <laughs> if you're still at the level where you like really feel like they really are your enemy that at least you can met, you can motivate yourself to not make them happy through uh fulfilling their wishes which would be your own unhappiness so uh you can think of your own fulfilling your own happiness as um a victory Mm. <laughs> Actually, my happiness would be to see you playing the, the karma, getting the karma as soon as possible. <laughs> it is a mystery of karma. You know, it's hard. Like when karma is not immediate, it's hard to learn the lessons. You know, mm -hmm. so I think that sometimes there is a healthy a hope that we would all, our karma would, would come, bear, come to fruit more quickly. You know, so that we could learn the lessons of all of our actions. 
Uh, mm, Metta to everyone. Really good to see yeah. you all. May, may I make an announcement real quick? Uh, uh -huh. You know, we have our monthly retreat coming yeah. up this. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 But we'll, okay, and so. you can look at our website. Uh, I'll okay. try to make sure that it's on there. Yeah. Right. 10 to 3. Yeah. Saturday 10 to 3, and Saturday and Sunday. Hawaii yeah. Loa Ridge. If you're on Oahu, mm -hmm. if you're in New York, you can think about. <laughs> uh, let's thank Trey for managing Yay! today. That was a great. Yeah. Thank you, Steve, for instructions. Jesse for talk. Mm. And um, you know, try to keep working with holding this, holding this, and we're we're here every Sunday to keep trying to hold it, hold it. So um, much meta to everyone. Sadly, sadly, sadly. sadly. Thank you. Good to see you.